hi everyone. I'm Dipali Trivedi, and I work as software architect for Constant Contact. Uh, just to give you uh, some overview of the things I did, um, I when I was in college school, right? I worked on few internal applications. Uh, when I came out of that and I joined professional career, I worked on few startups, few unsuccessful one, and few very successful one, right? And got chance to work on many enterprise applications. And during all these years, what I realized is that if you are developing a product or an application that is for hundreds of users or thousands of users, your architecture is very different versus uh, the product that will be public facing, internet facing, and that will have millions of users. So if you are working on a product that has thousands or millions of users and have many transactions per second, uh, it needs uh, security, it has mobile app, your architecture will be very different from the application that, more, that is more internal. And that is what we are going to talk about tomorrow, today. I mean, th that is the microservice architecture. Should we take up, understand microservice architecture, take up all the complexity and deal with all maybe issues with that, uh, if you are working on a highly scalable platform or highly transactional platform. So just on the agenda, uh, we will discuss the more traditional way of designing an application, right? Maybe if you wrote an application or product 10 years back, that is mostly monolithic architecture. We'll compare and contrast that with microservices architecture and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, we'll talk about scaling because scaling is the key if you are working on SaaS product and especially a successful one. Uh, we will talk about inter-service communication. Uh, one design pattern that I highly recommend if you are using microservice architecture and the transition, right? So if you are working on monolithic architecture, are you stuck with that forever or there is a way you can really go to the newer way of uh, writing your application? So monolithic architecture, and even though this looks very surreal, it's not really that fun if you are working on monolithic architecture in my experience. So uh, just, just my first job out of the college, right? And uh, it was a SaaS product, it was a mid-size, it had few clients, but it was not really that big uh, of a success. It was a, in, a, in, a, in a mid uh, three, four, five years old product. Uh, it had 60 developers, and all these developers were working on the same code base. It had many modules, but in the end, all these developers were deploying that code, like taking all their changes, deploying that as a huge ball of code and put it in a con container. And when I joined that, that company, and of course, uh, you know, being the first job, I was super excited, and I said, oh, today I'll take up a defect, or I'll take up a work, and I'll fix it, right? It took me a week to set up my project, because I had to, it has EJB, it had multiple container, it had all this code base. I had to, it, it took, took some time and it was, it was painful to really get to a point where I feel that I can work on any part of the product, you know, no, no, no worries. So that is the typical monolithic architecture. And I mean, I, there are three layers mainly. And for a long time, actually, we always thought that application architecture should have three layers, right, MVC. One, first is the browser, which will make a call to load balancer. All your code, your product module, customer module, payment module, uh, all these modules are uh, part of this one single uh, deployable year. I am from Java, so I'll talk about Java-related terms and technologies. So all these modules will be part of that year and deployed on the container. A browser will make a call to load balancer that will fan out to different server and then all these modules will talk to database and serve the request. Most of the time our product is all about write, read and you know delete sometimes and create. So that is the typical monolithic architecture if you are working on e-commerce, just very simple example there. What are the issues with uh, monolithic architecture? So first is a very steep learning curve. If you are a developer and you join a, a team that is working on monolithic architecture, it will take you a long time because the scope of your uh, code base is very, very vast. You, you have many modules and maybe for some time you will work on one side of the product, but to re really understand everything that you are working on, uh, it will take you some, some time. So a developer is overwhelmed when, when, when he will uh, start working on a monolithic architecture. A slow development and IDE. I mean, anyways, when you start IDE, it makes your laptop slow, right? And if you are going to import 
10, 15 projects, then it is going to make it really slow. And many times you are maybe just working on one project, so even this big monolithic architecture might have some modules inside that. All these projects will have dependency on other projects, and your project is depends, dependency of some other projects. So in the end, you end up uh, getting many projects in your ID, and that will make it slow, or if you make a change, it will end up compiling all these classes, it will make it slow. Uh, think of a build time. And again, the, uh, if I go back to the job that I was talking about, uh, the build time was 18 minutes. And if I run test, it takes a couple of hours. The regression was because the scope of testing was really huge. And I wanted to make sure that I do not really mess up anything. Just to tell you, I drank a lot of coffee during that job because I couldn't really sit there and watch uh, my computer running all this test and build. The, the biggest problem I see with monolithic architecture is Big Bang, right? If you heard about continuous integration and all this cool platform deploying to production multiple times in a day, you can't do any of that because uh, just your regression takes a couple of hours, right? Now think of like, think of running all other tests and all this developer making changes at the same time to the same code base. You cannot really take just your changes and go to production and deploy that. So, Ideally, in most of the monolithic architecture um, product development, um, all these developers will work for a couple of weeks or four weeks, and then they will schedule a time to, for deployment. And everyone is scared of deployment. I don't want to be the support person for this deployment. It's, it's because there will be issues, right? The 60 developers wrote code without knowing each and every side of the product. So it is a big bang. You hope for the best, and if you see issues, you spend uh, days figuring out. So uh, your time to market is, is, is really slow. Long-term commitment to the technology stack. Uh, you feel like, so when, today if I'm going to start a product, I'll think of the best technologies and tool available today, right? So most of the monolithic uh, architecture chose the technology that made a lot of sense at that time. But you know, after a few months, there'll be new framework, new library, and in few, Couple of years, there will be entirely different way of doing the same thing, right? I mean, technology space is so uh, innovative, you always have some other way or better ways to do the same stuff in a couple of years. Uh, you cannot really, okay, you cannot really uh, adopt new technology uh, if you are actually on monolithic architecture. So if you go back to the previous diagram, if here in database, if I'm using Oracle or if I'm using DB2, and I think that oh, for my use case, MongoDB makes a lot of sense and it, it has sharding, it will have high scalability, I can still query my database. You cannot really go and adopt MongoDB because if you want to do that, you have to change product module, customer module, payment module, authorization module, order module, all this module at the same time, change it to MongoDB, test everything at the same time and deploy everything at the same time. That means you have to tell your business that, oh, for a couple of months, we'll not do anything for you. We'll just go to MongoDB. Honestly, that is possible, but we never have that luxury of time when we are working on really a business use case and features. So uh, most of the time, a team working on the monolithic architecture feel like one of these people. Um, development team. So if you talk to product owner or uh, if you talk to business side of people, they always uh, complain, we are not going fast enough, we are not delivering a feature fast enough because there is definitely many competitors out there who are developing the same thing that you are developing, right? And you want to be the first one going to market. There is a huge advantage of that. So many times even company has money, a lot of money to really hire new developers and go faster. But if you are working on a monolithic architecture, you cannot really do that very effectively. Because when you add more developers, first of all, those developers need more time to start adding value. Second is that if you have more developers, still they are all working on the same product. So instead of 60 developers, if you have 120 developers, okay, it's, it's a bigger mess, right? More coordination. So even though you double your velocity, your productivity is not doubled. So you really, it, it's hard to see the advantage of hiring way too many developers if you are still stuck on this big architecture and big, big code base. So what can we do about it, right? What, what is a better way of doing it? And what is a, how all these other modern platforms are writing their product? Uh, so 
that is an answer is microservice. You should you should have microservices architecture and you should read microservice. So even before we go to the architecture, uh, what is microservice, right? And the the biggest uh, comparison I can give it to is, is a Lego block. Think of each microservice as a Lego block. So each Lego block is an independent unit. And it can, so when you combine multiple Lego blocks, you can make different structures. So that is the advantage of that, and that makes it agile. So similarly, each microservice is an independent unit that you can develop, deploy, test independently. But when you combine all these microservices and then use it in a particular format or particular sequence, then it becomes, it, it serves your use cases or it will serve your product. And that is, that, is, that is how you should see microservice architecture. You are actually building some structure using Lego blocks. Uh, scalability, so we are doing, the, you, you, you can be adopting microservices architecture for other reasons, but the main reason I see is scalability. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using, an, uh, using XYZ scaling from this Art of Scalability book, which is, which is a very good book to read if you are working on a scalable product. There are three ways to scale your product. Well, first is XXX scaling. So this is the traditional way of scaling our application. We, we have been using that for many, many years, right? What we do with this one is that, if maybe you are starting your product, this huge ER file that you are deploying on a container and you have a cluster of 10 nodes. If you see some success and you see 10x uh, scalability or growth for your business, instead of 10 nodes, you put 100 nodes out there. So you are just replicating your code base on multiple servers and that is XXX scaling. What is the problem with that is that all these modules are still talking to the same database. And that becomes your bottleneck because now all these modules are running a query that will join across tables and eventually when you have a lot of data, because we never delete data, right? Uh, eventually that will be a bottleneck. So what is the next level of scaling? That is Y axis scaling. So if, if you divide each of your functionality in a smaller pieces and make a separate service for each of that, you can deploy each of these services on different cluster. So here in XXX scaling, if you, have, if you are seeing more load on SSO, so you want to scale SSO 10 times, but product catalog maybe is the same. People are using product catalog at the same, same scale and you, want to, you don't want to scale product catalog service. So you can't do anything here, but if you have divided your SSO as a separate service and product as a separate service, you can add more load or more nodes on SSO service and then you can still keep the same scaling for product. So you can scale actually different modules at different scale if you have divided your application into a smaller unit, right? And that is more of a dividing that into microservices. But the, still, the first problem remains the same because if all these services are talking to the same database, same cluster of the database nodes, then you are still having the same problem because eventually you will see issues at database layer. And that's why this is a modern way of designing your uh, application is Z-axis scaling, and that is data partitioning. So ideally, each of your services sh should have its own database. So SSO should have its own database, uh, product should have its own database. So ideally, uh, you divide uh, your database layer also into multiple units, and that is the, the, the combination of y-axis and z-axis makes microservice architecture. And that's why it makes it uh, extremely scalable because you can use all three methods when you want to scale microservices architecture. Just to give you the example here, and I'm going to take the same e-commerce example so that you can relate to that. So if you have to take that monolithic e-commerce system and write it as a microservice architecture, this is how you can divide your services, first of all. So you will have authorization service, customer service, product service, order service, payment service. Uh, so there are many ways you can divide your application. And there, this is, it, it, it needs some experience to really uh, figure out how you divide your application. But the, the, the methodology that I use is domain-driven design application, uh, domain-driven dri design. So what I do is that I, I, I draw the domain diagram for the product and I take each domain entity and make a service out of it, right? So that, that really gives you some idea how can you divide your service. But there are people who take verbs and then try to go by verbs. Some people try, take nouns and go by that. But I try to really do the domain, domain design and then take each entity as a, as a service here. 
uh, what is the uh, what, what happens on the UI layer, right? And for a long time, people generally focus more on backend and how to uh, scale the backend. But now, given different types of UI and with mobile app, just there are just way too many UI for each product, right? So, what can you do for the UI? So, I. So if you have a UI that has 25 screens, you do not really have to divide each screen in a separate module, right? But you can think of similar use cases and combine that and write that as a separate UI. For example, here, you can have customer UI, consumer UI, maybe catalog UI, which is a more reusable UI component that, that, can, that you can use in multiple times. And here, uh, all this uh, UI will call services in different combination. Maybe, maybe my arrows might not make sense, but just to show you how you can divide your UI in the, in, into different uh, applications. So here, uh, and, and of course, in the end, you can show all these UI components in a, you can show all these UI components in a, in a uniform uh, UI experience, right? You do not have, they, they don't need to log in again to go to all this UI. You can run those in iframe or this UI or some other way so that it, it still looks similar and you can use the same look and feel, CSS, stuff like that, so that it doesn't look that they are different uh, applications. But the advantage here is that you can have different teams working on different UI part of uh, applications here, and then you can make progress on all these things, right? And the developers working on customer UI has to just know about the use cases of that UI and not product catalog and all the services that it is calling. So somewhere you are asking each developer to just focus on their particular part instead of knowing everything. So one, one, one biggest uh, uh, point I want to mention here is that, and many people who, I'm sure like many of you must be using uh, web services, right? And people think that if I'm using web services, REST services, or SOAP services, I'm using microservices architecture. That, that is not true. You can, you can still have monolithic architecture and have all your functionality exposed as microservices, or services, or REST services, right? But you, uh, if each of your service has a separate database uh, assigned to that, then only you are using microservices architecture. And that's why I want to just show it here. Uh, that here each of the service has its own database and ideally ideally you should never do joins or there should be never more than one service talking to your database and that is the best practices and guidelines for designing microservice architecture. Okay. Uh, so uh, when you design your microservice architecture, there are there are few few points you might want to think about, right? Uh, how small or how big should be your service, right? If you have too few, so if you have a huge code base, 4,000, 5,000 classes, and if you have just three web services, three microservices, and maybe one or two UI app, then you are not doing microservice architecture because you are doing small monolithic architectures. Each of your service is still too big, and, and you, are, you will not see the advantage of that. If you go with go crazy, and if you have 2,000 microservices, then that is too many, because in the end, you have to maintain those, uh, test those, uh, deploy those, and, 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 and manage the performance, right? Because in the end, your data is divided into 1,000, 2,000 services, and how do you even read across those things, right? So you, 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 you should use the right amount of microservices, just not too many, not too few. So now you realize that if you, uh, you are working on monolithic architecture, and if you are going with, uh, actually uh, uh, microservices architecture, instead of one unit, you are going to have multiple deployable units, right? So instead of one, this big ear that you have to test and de develop and deploy, you are going to have maybe 30, 40 deployable units, right? So now the key to success, so if you are going to manually deploy all those units, you are signing up for failure, for sure. So before, before even you divide your services or divide your product into microservices, you should have continuous integration and continuous delivery in place. So what is continuous integration? As a developer, when I check in my code, ideally that should kick off a Jenkins build or some other kind of build that should run all the tests, unit test and uh, regression test, and then once it passes, it should go to the next level of uh, uh, environment, where it should test all the integration tests 
and once it will that will pass it should go to the next level of environment and then it should run all the performance tests and then once everything passed it should go to production so ideally the time developer checks in there should not be any manual test before you go to production and ideally you should be able to write some code and then go to production without really um, uh, talking to other teams and making sure everyone is fine with that and without even coordinating because every change should be backward compatible and it should not break any existing functionality. And to really uh, do that, you need a lot of tests. So developer should write tests, tester should, QE should write tests, integration team should write tests, performance team should write tests. And ideally, that is how you can deploy your code. I mean, once you do that for a um, few months and you get better at that, you can actually deploy your code multiple times in a day without any issue. And every deployment, again, is an uptime deployment, so you do not have to worry about down, downtime or anything like that. So ideally, you build, you deploy, you test, and then you release. And you just continuously doing that without having any overhead. And that is theoretical. You will have some overhead, but having minimal overhead. And then only you can be successful if you are really using continuous integration here. Uh, advantages. So what are, what are the advantages? Uh, simple is always better and there are many people think that microservice architecture is not really simple but if you think a view of a developer it is very simple if you are a developer and you are just working on uh, one team that has few microservices four or five and then you have one ui maybe and taking care of two three databases i think your world is very simple and th th it's easier to understand it's faster to deploy and build and it's very easy to test because the scope of testing is low. So it's actually possible for you to know all the use cases of that service and then add some code you know, that makes sense and doesn't break anything. So it, it, it works really well for the developer. Uh, adoption of new technologies and framework. So um, think of a scenario that you, uh, you wrote a web service or a REST service few years back and that has JSP, Java, EJB in middle tier and it has maybe DB2. Uh, today you have a new initiative and you want to spin up a new service, you know that maybe EJP doesn't make sense and JSP is way too heavy. You want to use Node.js, you want to use Spring and you want to use Cassandra. You can do it because all these units are independent units. They will not share any database or code base here and they will just talk to each other via REST call or SOAP call or AMQP which is technology agnostic. So behind the scene you can use any technology that you want to use. In the, so just giving you example and you should not try for this because this will be disaster if you really use different data, <laughs> different databases and technology for each of your service. But you have flexibility to really do that and that is the, the, the really good thing for the developer. They, they are empowered to use the right technology if that makes sense and really uh, spin up a new service. Uh, on the scaling of development teams. So think of a new, there is a new initiative and uh, you want to, businesses, oh, we have money, we can hire more people. You can really spin up a new separate team that will write new services or you can add those people to the existing team and really scale your development team uh, uh, linearly, right? Today we want technology that can scale linearly. We want development team that can scale linearly, right? So linear scalability. Uh, ideally, you should have a small team. So I say two pizza rule. If you sh your team should be as big as it can be fed with two pizzas, right? And uh, that says some. It translates to number of services, microservices, and UI component that it should be owning. I mean, if you have one team that is taking care of 20 microservices, then you are not really you will not see the advantage of uh, microservice architecture in terms of uh, development velocity. Uh, so these are a few of the advantages. Um, just the next point here is that service-to-service uh, -service communication, right? And uh, there are most of the time companies who has worked on monolithic architecture for a long time will go for, with synchronous uh, communication between services. But I just want to specify two types and, and, and give the exposure that ideally if possible, you should use both at the right places. So what is the synchronous communication? It's like Joan is calling Mary and Mary should be available to take up the call at that time and answer Joe and then only Joe can call someone else, right? So if Mary is doing something else, um, Mary will not pick up call for one minute, Joe is really 
waiting there and not able to do anything else at that, at that time. And that is a more like traditional way of calling services. That is more of a request reply mechanism using <coughs> HTTPS or it can be actually REST JSON, SOAP XML or anything like that. It is simple. It is, it is way simple to design or develop that. It is way simpler to um, really show your error messages and stuff like that, but it's tightly coupled because it, so you just translate that to the services, right? Service A has to call service B and it's waiting for some response there or some information there. And if service B is slow or it's down, then service A will wait for some time until it will time out and that will make service A uh, slower. So ideally, if you have synchronous communication in your enterprise, every service communication is synchronous, then one slow service can take everything down or make everything slow. And you do not want that. And that's why every organization uh, using microservices should explore asynchronous communication. So what is asynchronous communication? If Joe is calling Mary, instead of calling that, he'll just text it. And nowadays, who even calls, right? Everyone texts. So yeah, he'll just text it. And Mary might be doing something else. But when she'll have time, she'll reply and say, oh, yeah, you needed that. This is the number. And yeah, go ahead. But meanwhile, Joe can be texting other people. And he can be doing other work. So he's not just waiting for Mary to reply. And that is a more asynchronous way of uh, communication, right? So here, if service A wants to talk to service B, it will just post a message. And then service B will pick it up whenever he'll ha it, it will have time. And meanwhile, service A can do anything. If service B, B is dead, then we'll talk to the failure mechanism. But um, service A is not down. Service B can be down, but service A will not slow down or will not be down, right? And that's the advantage here. So ideally, one failure in your organization will not take everything down. You will, you will see some issues, but you, you are still up and running. And that is the uh, biggest advantage here. So, and there are many, many frameworks and many technologies that can support that. So you can use RabbitMQ, you can use ActiveMQ, Node.js, Kafka. There are, there are way too many frameworks that you can choose from and really support this model. Uh, if I stand here and tell you that microservice architecture is awesome and once you use it, all your problems are solved, then that is a lie because there is, no, there is no architecture that is perfect, right? Every architecture has pros and cons and you should be aware of the cons as well when, when I tell you this is awesome and you should use it, right? So the uh, disadvantage is that it's a dis distributed database and people who has worked on monolithic architecture for years, uh, takes long time to really accept distributed database because they are so used to doing a jointed database layer, doing all this logic at database layer, just doing all that at service layer seems complex and slow and not fun, I would say. Uh, so it has distributed databases and that means that you really do not have database transaction. So if you are going to write to service A, write to service B and write to service C, and if C is down, you are, you can't write to service C, you are stuck with this orphan records in service A and service B because there is no foreign key constraint against all these uh, services. And um, if uh, in so other were ways to compensate and stuff like that, but in microservices, you just deal with those orphan records, you know, when you get chance, right? So that is the, the, the biggest disadvantage here. Uh, service versioning and maintenance. So uh, you sh if you are using microservices architecture, you should understand the, uh, the backward compatible changes, non-backward compatible changes, and then design your um, versioning strategy accordingly. You can use minor version, major version, you can use date-based version, you can use any, any other mechanism. It's a, it's a topic, it's on its own, how to do versioning and maintenance. Uh, chat UI, right? So I read somewhere uh, when you load a Netflix page, it talks to at least uh, 7,200 services in backend. So it's a very, very chatty UI, right? When each of your UI pages will have multiple calls. And the problem here is that, so think of an e-commerce uh, page, which will show you order history page for yourself, right? All the things that you buy. So it will show you order data. It will show you product data, right? And it will show you some payment data that you use this uh, credit, credit card, star, 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 whatever, and 5635 or something like that. So actually it is reading from multiple services and show it. So that page needs read from multiple services. Now who should do that com combination or aggregation? The, should you write a new service that will really combine everything? Should you write a new layer that will combine everything? Or should you let a UI do the, 
the combination, right, and aggregation. And if you have five, six UI for your product, you do not want your UI to do that, right? Because then you have to do that in every UI and that is against reusability. So, uh, and this, that, that goes back to the next thing I want to talk here is the API gateway pattern, right? So the, the platforms that use microservices architecture often go with API gateway pattern. So the, the, the problem I mentioned here, right, that there is a web application that has one page that needs data from multiple services. And either the web application can do it, layer can do it, or there can be a new service here. And what I'm proposing here, uh, what not I'm proposing, the people who use microservice architecture and use API gateway propose, that write a new layer for that. So that is called API gateway layer. Uh, some people, we here at Constant Contact call it platform layer. You can call it any layer that you want to. But the, 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 the idea here is that this is a single layer that will talk to services, manage the common functions, and then combine data. Or sometimes it's just a pass through. It doesn't have to every time combine data. There can be some UI that just show your UI uh, user setting, right? And it doesn't have to combine your data. So it will just be the pass through, and then it will manage the complexity. So what are the advantages of using this uh, KPI, uh, API gateway pattern? So first advantage is that, uh, so just to go back to the previous one, right? So here you have this multiple, uh, you have web application, mobile app, and third party UI or anything like that. Earlier when we did not have mobile application in the picture, we could have all our UI just living in our data center, right? We can just deploy that locally and run it from there. But now with mobile, ap mobile applications, you really need all your API to be public facing. It should be accessible by internet. Most of the web application today is pure JavaScript app, just living in CDN. So you need all your services to be public facing. Do you want to open up all these services to public facing and really deal with the security or you want to have this uh, common layer that will handle authentication and authorization? And that's where this layer is helpful. So the, that's why I start with the biggest advantage here is this common layer that will handle authentication and authorization. Second is that if you have used Java, Rx, or any other reactive programming, uh, this is a reverse way of, of doing your programming with API Gateway. You can do it because if your uh, service layer or data will change, API Gateway will, uh, will be observing that and getting the notification, and then you can you push, push that notification to the your UI. So instead of UI making the call, now everyone wants the reverse way of pushing your notification to UI, and you can use that, enable that, uh, if you are using API Gateway. A third is that, uh, you, as I said, you should not have just synchronous microservices. You should have HTTP-based microservices, REST-based microservices, and asynchronous like AMQP-based microservices. So now if you have combination of all these services, do you really want UI to handle all this complexity and remember that, oh, for this service I should use this kind of client and for other service I should use that kind of client. Instead of that, you can have API layer handling that uh, complexity and remembering that for this service, I should do AMQP-based client versus HTTP-based client. Service registry. So service registry is not must have uh, most of the time if you are uh, deploying in your data center, right? Because there is a fixed number of uh, nodes allocated to its service, and then uh, each service has this specific uh, load balance are assigned to it and you always call through that, right? So there is no dynamic discovery of the service needed. But if you are in, in, in public cloud and which might have failover and then your service can move to some other zone and there can be many dynamic um, uh, addresses for your services, at that time you really need service registry integration that, is, that can discover your services, service dynamically and then use that service at that time. So that integration can live with API gateway. Uh, partial fa failure handling, and this is like my favorite topic. So how do you design your product that can handle fi failure, right? So if, I don't know if any one of you come from SOA background, but in SOA we used to say that each service should have 100% uptime, and which was, which is very theoretical. It is not possible. You will always have downtime, right? And you should design your interactions, you should design your product to handle those failures. So the example here is that if your product service is down, right, and for example, if you have recommendation service, you have recommendation for the product that user can buy. And if that service is down, instead of not showing anything or showing any error message or anything like that, you can just show top 10 product, right, that is very successful and you can. So ideally you should 
it's not just the technical design, it's a functional and technical design to think of partial failure and design your product and interaction to handle that. And those complexity can live in API gateway. So API gateway can call the recommendation service. If it is down, it can call product service and get the top 10 product from, from that one. So those complexity can be handled there. Uh, so is microservices right for every use case, right? If you are working on anything, is it right for you? I would not think so. So if you are working on a startup, you have five developers or four developers, limited fund and limited use cases and you have no idea whether this will be the next big thing or this will just, someone will throw out, right? I mean, at that time you might not want to really take up the complexity of microservice architecture. You can develop that in a more traditional way, monolithic architecture, which will be faster initially, right? Uh, with five developers, it will be really fast. And once you see the success, when you get the next round of funding, you get uh, you get uh, feedback from the customer that this is this is awesome. Then you can re-architect uh, your your product and really write with microservices architecture. But if you don't do it, then you can't really do do it with three or four or five version of your product. So do it as early as possible. When you think that this is something I'm going to maintain for five to seven years, that that is the time you really divide your application into microservices and go with that. Second here is that the, the, the biggest push we saw for microservices architecture was because of mobile development, right? Um, monolithic architecture or more traditional way of architecture was focused on one UI, one business layer, and one database. But that is not true with multiple UI. And if you really have multiple UI, um, you are going to have multiple mobile app and stuff like that, then microservice architecture will give you a lot of advantages because you can really uh, decide whether you push some of the business rules on services side or you push it on UI side, how to reuse those things and how to have public facing API actually for your product. Uh, how to transition? So. Um, if you are working on a monolithic architecture and if you think, oh, I mean, I don't know when we are going to write second product or third product or when are, when are we going to do the new version of our product, how can I use microservices gradually, right? So you can do it. It's only the mindset change. You should be able to really uh, educate your team and really start with that. So one way of doing it is that any new feature that you write or any new domain entity that you add, you should write that as a microservice. It should have its own database here and then you should have some glue code which will make this integration work. So your monolithic architecture can call these services whenever it needs some data from that entity. So eventually as you have more uh, functionality and more domain services, you will have more services on this side instead of keep adding more stuff on this side. And once you have more experience with uh, microservice architecture, you can actually take smaller part from this big ball and put it as a service. And then eventually this can shrink and this can grow. And then still you have to maintain your monolithic architecture, but you will see, uh, fewer issues or you will start seeing the advantages of that. And developer can, can start using new technology on this side and really uh, see advantages for that. So, and it is complex and many companies don't do it because uh, writing business layer this way is easy, but migrating data is the problem, right? And that's why many, uh, most of the companies end up rewriting their product if they have time and money for that. But there is a way you can make it work and start seeing the advantages of microservices. And that is my last slide. Thank you and any questions? Thank you.